Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast, where we talk with the people behind the current events and breakthroughs in brain implants in an understandable way, helping bring together various fields involved in neuroprosthetics. Here is your host, Ladin Yurichek. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Neural Implant Podcast and I guess the Scraps Podcast with Arun Sridhar. We known each other and, and contacted both being in science and, and neural podcasts, but we really wanted to talk about this latest NIH Neuromod prize, a $9.8 million prize. So Arun, welcome on the show and and I'm welcome on your show, I guess. We're, we're doing a cross-promotional thing. So how are you doing? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, lad, and appreciate the the kind introduction there. Yes, I think we decided that we would probably talk about this, and then the our goal is for this particular episode to be released on both our kind of podcast channels, uh, so that people can actually go and find uh, our audience, which is which might be very different to what you might actually have, can actually go and find each other's kind of podcast here. But that's really how we kind of are going to do the finished product, but that's not the motivation for why we are talking in the first place. So we, I think this is an interesting enough topic for uh, to have a discussion about, and I'm happy that, that you actually asked me to have the discussion around this uh, with you. Yeah, thanks. I think this is a very interesting topic. Uh, this was released January 18th. NIH launches first phase of $9.8 million competition to accelerate development of neuromodulation therapies. We're uh, recording this a week later, and hopefully it'll be published pretty soon. But yeah, $9.8 million of prize money. First of all, I think we were talking about this before the recording. This really reminds me of the X Prize. And X Prize, as you may remember, is a 1996 competition offering $10 million prize for the first privately financed team that could build and fly a three passenger vehicle 100 kilometers into space twice within two weeks. So basically I had to re- refuel. And then eventually that, that did end up happening in October, 2004. So it was that eight years later. But yeah, so basically uh, tons of people were doing it. Apparently, in the, according to this Wikipedia article, 26 teams from seven nations. So it's a good way. I don't know. You don't really like this. I think it's cool because I think it's a good way to leverage and not waste, but get people to take part in something for less total money than if they were to just get a grant or something like this. This is going to be my perspective on things. What, what do you think about this? Yeah. So first of all, I'm actually not an NIH employee. I don't have any public grants or anything of that sort from the NIH. This, my opinions are completely from a perspective of someone who has been in the area for a long time, probably predating the NIH's involvement in creating the Spark initiative in the first place, et cetera. So I've seen the entire kind of genesis as well as development and progression of the whole initiative. So first things first, I, I do, I'm, I'm not against the price for first of all, but I think there are some basic tenets that, that people need to understand. So yes, X price is exciting and it basically offered a pretty large part of money for one single winner, if I'm correct, that ultimately would get it. But the way the NIH Neuromodulation Prize is designed is very much based out of an innovation challenge that I was part of. And in a way that I was working for GSK, GlaxoSmithKline, Bioelectronics, R&D at the time. And I had a hand in drafting the success criteria for the challenge when the entire kind of neurotechnology, neuromodulation world was very much focused towards DBS and SES and spinal cord stimulation and potentially neuroprosthetic areas with the whole DARPA nets and and DARPA subnets and all of those programs. I think we were one of the first people at the time to actually create the buzz around peripheral neuromodulation outside the brain and outside the spinal cord. And if you go back and Google all of this in 2013, there were basically three core things that the company had actually announced at the time. The first one was basically creation of an R&D unit that I was part of, creation of a venture unit, which is action potential venture capital uh, that was directly coming out of, of the balance sheet of the corporate arm of the company. And then the third one was basically an annual kind of meeting that ha- that happened, or it was designed to be the first bioelectronic summit And it was then for the community to take up and do the summits afterwards. And then the fourth part of this was really to announce an innovation prize, which was termed as an innovation challenge, because everybody that we spoke to, uh, all the people that 
we're not in traditional neuromodulation, but we're part of looking at modulation of how nerves were modulating disease and disease conditions outside the brain and spinal cord. They were all telling us that uh, we need something that can be used in, in, in preclinical or non-clinical animal models. And uh, since most of the animal models were all kind of rodent models for most of the chronic disease conditions that most people would study as a disease model, because large animal models can be pretty expensive, it was decided at the time that the Innovation Challenge would actually focus on developing a fully implantable rodent system that was capable of stimulation, neural blocking, and ultimately being able to differentiate between selectively being able to modulate one function over the other. I was able to find out or obtain the success criteria, and I send that to you, which you can possibly add in the in the episode description, etc. And there, the difference was that compared to the X Prize, because it was identified as a way to catalyze the the community. A $1 million price was actually the, the price pot. It was going to be going to one person who would actually develop this. And the more that we spoke to the community, it basically came out. It was very clear that uh, $1 million price was appreciated by everybody. But the cost of developing a fully implantable system, even if it is for a rodent uh, model or a rodent studies, would actually be much more than a million because most of the people who are actually going to apply for this were all academics, leave alone public private partnerships at the time. Most of these folks were telling us that you actually need some additional incentive beyond just the price. So therefore, I think after Anil Achita, who is now who was with Draper at the time and consulting with GSK Bioelectronics and now is, is actually uh, he's at TDK Ventures. He and another colleague of, of, of mine called Roy Katsu, I think we all sat together and we decided and Roy proposed the idea that it has to be something that has to be a bit more than just the 1 million. So at that time, there was a competition that was actually announced in addition to the price, which was to basically give in to five teams of where the price part of stage one was 100K, which is exactly the price part of what the NIH neuromodulation price stage one really is, or phase one really is. From that, they basically would, would, would develop the, the prototype and develop everything that would ultimately garner an additional kind of million dollars that would be given to approximately, I think if I'm correct, maybe one or two different teams. In addition to the $1 million price, there was also the 500 k kind of competition in phase one plus an additional million or million uh, or two million that was going to be provided to the academics to develop it. The truth of the story is that none of the solutions that was uh, kind of provided at the time was not deemed to be good enough to actually warrant a phase two of the study simply because those were all efforts that was already ongoing, and the initial phase one did not result in an appreciable kind of jump in the technology. So people were basically taking the phase one money, they were retooling, rejigging it in a small way, resubmitting a proposal five months down the line to actually get the bigger part of money. So the learnings from that was basically the following, which is the fact that when you the cost of developing a fully implantable system, even if it is non-regulated for rodent studies, is slightly more expensive. And you might have probably seen the news that just this month, I think people from New York, Timir Datta and others have just published a fully implantable system capable of, of stimulating um, the vagus nerve in, in the rodent models. So yes, it was delayed by, by a few years, etc. But those are the kind of work that would have anyway happened in the area. So we were indicated in that view at the point at, at the time, uh, based on what's currently playing out in the field right now. And did it result in us enabling other animal studies? Yes, we actually found a different alternative to fully implantable systems, et cetera, based on the techniques that has been used in the field for many years especially with deep brain stimulation, et cetera, et cetera, in, in animal models. So that kind of works really well, but it would still be nice to have an implantable system, of course, but 
I think now that the one group has actually published and potentially is trying to make it available, hopefully that will actually garner other people to do it. Now, coming back to the NIH neuromodulation price here, I think if an idea is actually copied, and I'm always, I'm never offended by it because if an idea is always copied, it's, it must be a really, it's, somebody must think it's a really good idea. So I always believe in actually copying right and copying left. There is nothing called as copyright. You copy right and you copy left. You just acknowledge the source and you move on. And that's where most scientists and most innovators will actually get their inspiration from seeing one another, et cetera. And that's just the way of life. In terms of the neuromodulation price, the phase one is entirely identical to that. And the bar is actually raised from going from what was a preclinical system to ultimately developing a human grade system to be able to, that is capable of treating patients in the later stages uh, of the price, which in itself, I think for people in the area, they will probably understand that the cost of developing such a system and putting it through all the kind of development process and, and testing process, verification, validation process, and the regulatory process, et cetera, is going to be much more than just the 100K initially, plus another 1 million, plus another kind of 4 million. It's only for people who I would actually go through all of that, that they would be lucky enough to bag potentially close to 5.5 million of price to be able to develop that. And based on Everything that Spark has actually done so far, most of the work seems to have been concentrated on existing neural pathways, and there is very little um, evidence based on the publicly available information that is disclosed in the databases, et cetera, that show that there are new targets to treat other chronic conditions. And most people kind of default to either the cervical vagus or the connections that actually happen, but not necessarily in terms of a translatable neural target that would have what I define as a nodal intervention point that will help you to identify therapy versus risk, et cetera, and be able to perform that. So an additional criteria, in addition to the financial kind of prices here, that one nerve has to be capable of modulating more than one function. And the teams will actually have to show that the nerve stimulation or neuromodulation at that particular target site is able to selectively modulate one function over the other without affecting function number two and vice versa. So therefore, based on everything that Spark has funded so far, they have not really funded any work in terms of identification of new targets. So I almost think that if you haven't catalyzed that particular area, then expecting people in the ecosystem to come up with new targets and ultimately putting in a proposal for the neuromodulation price is, I would probably bet, if I was betting it, I would probably say that it is not a realistic option. So that's my reservation. So I'm not against the price. I just think that a lot of these are not entirely considered at this point of time. Yeah, that's really interesting. Lot, lots to unpack there. I think this is a very interesting perspective. Basically, they're not giving enough money for, for prize money. But I think if you talk to any competitors, they'll always say, yeah, give us more money. <laughs> but it very much is true. It, it's not a realistic, it's, it's just too little. And it actually reminds me, I, I did a, a medical device competition in my undergrad and uh, it was for our senior design project. And we were basically making a mechanical leech. So they actually still use leeches in, in some aspects of surgery. And so we made a mechanical version and we won you know, a prize in this competition. We won $10,000, which is, wow, this is great. But to make a medical device costs a million, $5 million to bring to market. And so $10,000 is less than 1% of that. So it very much seems like this, it, it's this prize money yield. You'll, you'll eventually have to go somewhere else to get more money. But that prize money also gives a halo around your company. Oh, okay, this has been analyzed by another group and, and a prestigious group. So maybe it makes things raising other money easier. But yeah, so I also see this a little bit in this way. And then yeah, $10 million, this GSK competition that you helped put together, uh, 
this NIH prize is very similar to this. That was and actually just a $1 million prize. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, wasn't it was, it was $1 million. million yeah, yeah, sorry. $1 million. And yeah. then, but the X prize, which is the one that, that uh, sent them into space twice, that one was $10 million. And I think this was before we started recording. You have to factor in the overhead of the university is what you were mentioning, which is basically 50% off the top. And so it's very much, much less money. It sounds like a lot of money, but then when it comes down to it, it's actually not that much. And especially for developing a medical device and, and medical technology, technology, it's almost nothing. <laughs> it's almost, I don't know, it's, it's even offensive maybe. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me actually paint it with a bit more color there. So for example, most people will actually know about the vagus nerve, right? So vagus nerve is always the snake oil for the neuromod kind of ecosystem in a way, because vagus nerve controls multitude of functions. I think if somebody is developing a selective way of modulating the vagus nerve, unless they are targeting only a sp- large fibers that mediates one particular function in in a disease and every other function is modulated by other fibers which are not the the large unmyelinated fibers you basically have to redevelop your neural interface number one number two if you're going for some other nerve target you all of those are going to be smaller than the vagus nerve so which means you anyway have to develop a new novel neural interface. And then you're basically going to say, okay, even if I'm going to pair it with an existing IPG, and even if you talk about public-private partnerships and everything else, there is always a cost for everything. And those partnerships are not going to happen at this stage. They might actually happen at phase two when they actually provide the $1 million kind of pool or a $4 million pool for to up to four participants is what they call it on the website. Developing a neural interface from scratch and getting it through everything is approximately going to cost you anywhere between kind of three to $4 million. This is through all the way through to the end. And then on top of that, you're talking about pairing an IPG with an existing neural interface to be able to even able to put it through regulatory testing. All of those regulatory testing costs are going to be on top of it, plus filing for the clinical trial kind of approvals, the procedures, protocols, et cetera, is all going to be on top of that. So everything gets added. So therefore, my point being that when you're always running against a clock, especially if you have a pool of, of applicants that have that are trying to develop a therapy, that in a way is an inefficient way to develop a therapy because when you're developing a therapy, you should be focusing on the right things. And therefore, because you're always on a race against the clock, I'm not saying that people are going to cut corners, but just that it's actually an an innovation way because just because somebody is getting there first, it doesn't necessarily mean that's the best solution that's going to be out there. And we found that out. This is just my reflection of that. This is not official GSK conclusion of anything, but having been there, done that, I think people figured out that this is probably what's going to happen. And the second thing that the point that you made is really the overheads, because the overheads is a killer when it comes to academic grants, especially if you're funding it from a price perspective, because it's impo- it pays for really important stuff that for people who are involved in the grant. So when you take 50% of that, then you're actually left with a lot less pool of money at every stage. And that is not essential to, to proceed to, to fund the development, which means the people who are actually, the applicants will have to look for other sources of money, which means they would anyway probably do that. And this is just an extra pot of money that basically gives them a slightly additional advantage, but not a lot of advantage. So that's my issue with the Neuromod price and the price structure, as it says, as it stands, because it's not the best way to to develop therapies, in my opinion. And because it's a price, they are actually bound by legal language and legal frameworks where they potentially should not, or um, I'm not a lawyer again, but from everything that I've heard, once you've put out a criteria and if you have announced a price, you're not bound to change those things based on competition laws from everything that I've heard of from hearsay and interpretations and meetings that others have had with experts in the area. All in all, it's going to be a very interesting thing to follow, but definitely not something that's not going to have an issue. So times, times shall say what the outcome is going to be. 
Well, yeah, exactly. We'll see. So it really sounds like this is not a good thing for university labs. There, there might not be any university labs that are interested in this. But since you were basically running, helping run this at GSK in 2014, this was eight years ago, there's a lot more neurotech companies around, a lot more investment in this kind of stuff. And maybe that's what's changed. Like maybe it is a different environment nowadays. And there are more individual or like private entities willing to go after this kind of quote unquote risky, risky prize which might might bring something might not maybe they're more willing to do it so i don't know I, I stick by my original thesis that this is the this is a good way to get more people more interested bodies you know again as we were talking for the x prize there was uh, 26 uh, people participating and if it was just a grant i don't think you would have 26 people applying for the grant so you just get more of that and you know maybe some of it is private money that they end up losing but for the field it's good and if somebody loses a million dollars of their own money by not winning a prize like that's on them so w- what's the harm in that there is, it's a great way to catalyze an ecosystem. And I think, yeah, the, compared to eight years ago, there are more companies, there is more money in neuromodulation for startups at every stage. And at the same time, the number of nerve targets that are there are that are exploring novel targets that hasn't been there or that wasn't explored before are very less. I can possibly think of probably less than five examples in the area at this point of time. All of them are currently clinical stage companies. And then remember the criteria for the neuromodulation price is that it has to be a nerve target based on everything that's on the website. It has to be a nerve target that basically controls more than one function. So therefore, the re- one needs to demonstrate physiology that they can modulate one function without affecting the other and vice versa. But that may or may not necessarily be required from a therapy perspective because the tolerability might be okay from a clinical perspective, but then you're solving for something just for the sake of winning the prize when it may or may not necessarily be involved for therapy. Or it might be the case that the tolerability effects uh, or the whatever the effects, the functions of the nerve is actually performing is so widely spaced that somebody could actually come in and say, I'm doing this at, w- at one type of parameter set and that does X function without affecting function Y. And then when I'm moving up to really crazy, it's not doing anything to the other thing. But I've not seen much evidence so far in terms of the direction that it wants to move, which is to catalyze the field towards new nerve targets, not existing ones, and and then moving that forward to develop therapies for those nerve targets, using those nerve targets for new target indications, et cetera. So that's what, that's where I believe it's going to be an interesting thing to watch is all I'm saying. I'm not against the price. I just think that there are some crucial things that people should actually understand in the small print, which is not necessarily appreciated unless you are the PI who is writing the grant or you're probably the person who is watching it from the outside, like the way I am, just because I've actually had past experience in doing it through the innovation challenge, et cetera, at the time with GSK. Yeah, for sure. No, that's a very good point. Like people could be gaming the system, optimizing the game instead of patient outcomes and what's actually good, I don't know, for the field or for humanity or something like this. So they could be trying to win the prize instead of, which which makes sense. That's their incentive versus actually trying to do that. The last point is just that I think these things would anyway be done. Why wouldn't somebody apply for a STTTR or SBIR Uh, system that is already there. There is already a blueprint med tech program that is already available that from NINDS to develop a kind of similar kind of new therapies, et cetera, that is, that was launched last year. Then I think Spark, the first stage of Spark was probably successful in NHIs. They've actually reintroduced what is called a Spark 2, where they actually have kind of the Spark V, which is basically entirely a focus on vagus nerve and nothing else. And then you basically have the anatomical mapping section, which is the which I believe is actually called Spark O, which is to develop open source technology for altering nerve function. And then the last one is basically the Spark X, the last arm, which is basically a competition or a challenge, which is where this one falls under. So it's almost like it's been predetermined that this is the way it is going to be run. And they're hoping that people are going to show up. 
given the fact that everybody is already focusing on the Vegas and everybody in Spark One, we're all looking at some aspects of existing nerve targets and they were all looking at the level of the organ or what's happening in the brain, but nothing in between. Like they don't, nobody reads still, despite Spark having invested a lot of money, very few people actually know what those pathways are between the organ and the brain, which is where new targets actually come into play, which is still an open book at this point of time, or to many people, it's probably a black hole. So how is somebody going to come up with a proposal for to put in for a neurobot price to develop a therapy focused on a novel neural target that controls more than one function with the ability to selectively be modulated and to take that into the clinic? It just seems like a very wishful thinking. And I think I should probably stop talking about that uh, for now then. Yeah, really. It is. Yeah, I think it is wishful thinking. It is. It's a big ask. And again, going back to the X Prize, like in 1996, like going to space twice in in two weeks was just like this is insane. How are you going to accomplish this? I keep you know referring back to that because nowadays it's not as big of a deal or, or some of the issues have been figured out. But no, I don't know. I think it is good. Again, like grants, SBIRs they don't really have fanfare. They don't really have a a ceremony or a big press release. Or if it is a press release, then it makes a pretty small splash. Usually I would say less than 50 people are maybe reading it or something like this. An event like this, a party, a competition could attract a lot more attention, media and everything like this. And depending on how they do it, it could be much better. And then that's the question is like, how much is that media attention worth? And then more eyeballs on the on the field, maybe more money coming in, all this kind of stuff. I don't know. I, I think it could be good if it's done the right way. I think it could be done. I think it could be really good. And and it could be worth even more than the essentially the 10 million that they're putting into it just from all the attention, free publicity that they might be able to get. But yeah, no, it's very important to to have very clearly defined parameters and rules and everything like this. And and in that case, I mean it needs to be clear enough that the companies or, or competitors, they they understand it. They don't game it. They play fairly or they play in a way that helps the patient in the end. But I think it needs to be clear also in a way that uh, I guess the media understands it. And there's not like crazy bylaws or sub rules or something like this that, that it could be clearly explained, for example, in a tweet or in a 60 second news section, something like this. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm still convinced that, that this could be a good thing, but actually let's maybe move to something else. What would you recommend? What would be another system? Okay. So we, we've talked about basically grants, SBIRs, funding like research grants. Now we're talking about these competitions and you're saying that maybe both of those aren't exactly the best tool to do the grant to give money. What would you say? What would you suggest would be a better way? Yeah, so SBIRs are absolutely a fantastic tool because that is that single-handedly has funded multiple programs and its seed stages. Et and actually, do you want to do you want to describe what the SBIR is? Yeah, so yeah, I think the again, once again, I don't live in the US, so if some of the acronyms are not said correctly, I think I urge people to actually go back and look at some of the the. There is a fantastic kind of recent interview that I think. Giovanni Loricella did it on the MedTech Money podcast with Emily Caparello on the SBIRs. So SBIRs deals with small business innovation research grants, I think, and the STTTRs. Uh, so SBIRs are applied by the startup companies themselves, whereas STTTR, which is basically a collaboration with an academic partner, is basically how it will be the academic who is applying with a partnership with the with a private entity, like a company, et cetera, is the way. So there are two different mechanisms and those are funded probably from what I understand through every research institute in NIH or most of them and National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke has one and similar to every other kind of major institute. That has done a fantastic job and they call themselves as the America's Seed Fund, which is absolutely true. I think if not for SBIR grants, a lot of these, a lot of companies may not have necessarily been able to raise quite a bit of of non-dilutive capital. I think coming back to the NIH Spark, I think the Neuromod Prize will definitely catalyze and bring attention to the area. There's no doubt. Where I think there were gaps based on everything that I've seen from what the Spark won, which is the, I think was a $250 million kind of commitment that was made in early 2014, when Kip Ludwig was the program director, and then Gene Sivlico kind of took over when Kip moved out from Spark from NIH to academia, et cetera, was the fact that they focused on multiple nerve targets, multiple kind of grant funding mechanisms, et cetera. But 
the huge gap that actually exists and having seen everything that's actually come out from that in terms of data is that they very much focus, it's, it's a focus on mapping, both functional mapping as well as anatomical mapping. A lot of that is focused predominantly on the organs themselves and ultimately where these nerves might actually end up in terms of the, the brain regions, et cetera. Those are fantastic to know. And it's very important to know from a mechanistic point of view. But what was really lacking in that area was how these structures or how these organs were actually communicating, what were the conduits? So what was the wiring through which it was ultimately going to and fro from the brain? And having done my role in with, with, with Galvani and GSK and everything that is currently happening in the field, et cetera, I think the biggest innovation from a peripheral neuromodulation side can actually come from is discovering a new target that ultimately opens up. Otherwise, everybody is going to take a niche of an existing hypoglossal nerve stimulator or a deep brain stimulator or a spinal cord stimulator. That market might increase, but it's going to saturate and the big existing players will still keep fighting among themselves. And I think if you're going to open up new innovation, that's what you need. And I've not seen any evidence where deciphering those wiring diagrams has actually not played a huge part, number one. Number two, another big gap where I personally think this $9.8 million could have potentially served well is that just like the way there are there is basically different parts of the brain in the peripheral autonomic nervous system outside the spinal cord, outside the dorsal root ganglion, which many people would actually study in terms of sensory functions and other things, there are multiple ganglia in the body. And those ganglia are super interesting because those ganglia are basically bridge points. You'd almost, the way it's written in the textbooks is that one gang, one axon in and one axon out, like with a little circle and a, and a little kind of V and a dot. That's so not true based on all the evidence that has been published dating back to the 60s and the 70s and the 80s based on histology and everything else. There are ways in which cell bodies in those ganglia are arranged in a topological way to control functions of multiple organs that come out that, the, that this ganglia innervates. And number two, 80%, 70 to 80% of the axons that are actually in the ganglia never leave the ganglia. So it's almost like a big telephone exchange box or a big black box and there are some ganglia in the body which almost acts what you can almost call it as a mini brain. People refer to the, uh, the gastric enteric nervous system as mini brains, et cetera. But that is definitely true. But there's a whole host of other kind of ganglia, which are both sensory and motor. And nobody really understands how that is actually there. And if that is a big gap that needs to be filled, because you cannot understand the mechanisms without really understanding what this junction box is going to really is doing because you're measuring from where the signal is coming from or going to, which is the organ, say the heart or say the pancreas or the liver or whatever that might be. And then you're measuring things in the brain where it's actually starting or ending from. You have no idea how many diversions this neural signal is actually going to take, et cetera. And the single minded focus on just the vagus nerve is a bit short-sighted. And this is where I think I've moved from being very politically correct to probably being very opinionated is that I think the single-minded focus on just the vagus is just so short-sighted that there needs to be other things on things, for example, that I've just outlined, the entire wiring diagram plus these mapping, these junction boxes, et cetera. Those are two items that I think the $9.8 million could have been much better spent on because that will lead to a whole host of people, engineers, technologists in mapping and functional mapping, physiologists all working together. That is not happening now. And just because you develop a therapy, it may not necessarily lead to that. So I think understanding and closing that loop there between what's happening between the organ and the brain is so important because that's where you discover new targets from. That's where you discover new data from. That's where you discover new mechanisms from. Uh, and that's not happening right now. That's my issue. And it's not because the people are not aware of it. I think it's just the reluctance to, to hear and act on it uh, is really the issue from my perspective. 
Yeah. So it sounds like you're advocating a little bit more basic science, basic neuroscience, and find exactly some of the mechanisms, what's going on. So I think, yeah, that is very much opposite maybe to what they were trying to do at the NIH, because I would say basic science is the the opposite of a competition, the opposite of fanfare. And Hey, Spark came, comes from the Office of the Director's Common Fund. And from what I understand, that's for high-risk, high-reward projects. And it it shouldn't be for for a hammer looking for a nail option it should be for something that that's where the entire microbiome projects came from and and i shouldn't be the one talking as i said i'm not even american in the remote sense but i've only followed that optogenetics came from that so if you did not really understand those aspects the big unknown questions i think then then who else is going to do it is my point and i think that's what the spark actually started with back in 2014 but i think somewhere in the middle, I think they've been swayed by the here and now while still forgetting what the unknown gaps are and trying to call for proposals to fill those gaps. Because I would argue that everything that's been described in the neuromodulation price would probably be done by an existing entity or a potentially licensing out from an existing university or a company or a startup. It doesn't necessarily require a price. It might just very well be fulfilled by other mechanisms is my point, but it'll still catalyze the field. It, it will bring the attention, et cetera, but is that the right attention that you want to bring and still leave the unanswered questions the way they are is my point is something that I don't know. Yeah, What's definitely. It? Definitely. I, I always think of science and, and you know basic science kind of building the tools that then later engineers can use and engineers can then build whatever else that they need, but they need the tools from the, the scientists to be able to do that or to do that more effectively. So basically what you're saying is we only have a hammer. We only have six tools right now. We need more tools and only then can we, can we actually build something of value. But I would suggest, or I would argue that the prize is actually a really good way to do this because going back to the X prize, like it was started in 96 and then it wasn't, nobody won it until eight years later. So if they don't meet the criteria, you don't have to give that money. You could just keep repeating that prize potentially every two years, every four years, something like this, and maybe save that money. And only when somebody quote unquote wins it, do do you actually have to pay? So I I don't know. I think that's good too. That is a silver lining in a price. If it's not a grant, it's a, if it's a price, you basically reserve the right to not award the price, which is so which means everything may not necessarily be awarded or it might be rerouted for other use cases, et cetera. But I'm sure 9.8 million is not the only pot that NIH is actually working from. They actually have a far bigger pot and this is a smaller chunk of that to fulfill one of the arms of the Spark 2 initiative here. So yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Yeah, in different perspectives. And I guess I'm coming a little bit more from engineering side. So I'm like, engineers, let's do that. Hey, think about this. I'll, okay, one more point. If you want to understand, if you're an engineer who loves developing tools, you need to know what you're working with is actually a hardened nail or a hex screw or a Phillips screw or something that's totally different. If you're going to, ha- if you're going to hit with a hammer on a hex screw, it's not going to go in. You can try all that you want. It's just not going to go in. So therefore, defining what the problem is that you're developing a solution is more important rather than retooling an existing thing and hoping that it'll work, hoping that a new nerve target, a new hex screw or a new wood screw or a new Phillips head kind of screw, et cetera, will just pop up somewhere through the woodwork that you might find it is just, as I say, wishful thinking. Yeah, very much. Okay, if you had to, if you had to guess what kind of timeline, if they were to do a, a prize like this again, maybe 22, 22 is too early. When do you think it would be make more sense to do something like this? I mean, that's not my decision to make, to be honest with you. I think I would probably, as I said, would probably think of the big gaps that has been identified from Spark 1 and then use that to focus in Spark 2, at least in part. That's what I would like to see having known the people, having literally sat at the table at the Innovation Bioelectronic Medicine Summit back in 2013 and moderating the table that ultimately became part of the Spark Initiative map, roadmap, et cetera, at the time. That's what I would love to see. Okay, cool. Arun, this is really interesting. Do you want to talk about your podcast as we're finishing up and, and what does your podcast cover? 
Yeah, and I think my co-host and uh, co-producer Jojo has been on your show a few times, so people probably know her. I am I'm the scientist, and and Jojo brings her kind of. Uh, marketing and strategy and, and and knowledge of things that are happening in the area. I come from it from a very analytical angle in the podcast. Our podcast is called as Scraps. It is the word Spark spelled backwards, simply because we love covering Spark stories of sparks of scientific brilliance in technology, science, and innovation. And for this season, so we actually did two seasons of interview-based podcasts, one season of documentary-style podcasts on psychedelics. And then this season, we are actually doing one on bioelectronic medicines at this point of time. We have some very interesting kind of educative slash engaging episodes lined up. The first episode on the trailer is actually out now, but there should be more interesting kind of episodes that will come through, which we promise is going to be very different from all the information that's out there. And the hope is that we will start creating the first compendium of information for the field of bioelectronic medicines. To start with, it's going to be a long haul, but at least somebody has got to start it because every time you talk to an engineer, they basically refer to a few neural interface papers or, and then you talk to a clinician, they refer to an entirely different bunch of papers or things to refer to. A research physiologist would basically refer to a completely different one. And depending on if you're working in the brain or the spinal cord, or if it's a biomedical engineer working on this, they all refer to different things. And the idea is to bring it all together and tie it with a bow for each focus topic, and then let people pick additional details from each of those topics is really the idea so that we can start the conversation to really understand how big and how different bioelectronic medicines um, area is compared to the traditional kind of pharma biotech and also with the traditional medtech, I would argue. It's very different. So this is our effort to bring it all together and put it under one umbrella so that people have somewhere to go to to check out on all the information. No, that's really cool. I, I think having a standardized source of information is really good. And that way people can be brought up to speed, beginners or uh, people just interested in the field that can be brought up to speed pretty quickly. And, and even those that may have gaps in their knowledge, maybe advanced in their career, but still have gaps in their knowledge, it can bring them up to speed too. And this is something I've been also thinking about. Oh, I, w- I would love to put something like this together, but when I have to commend you, it's going to be a lot of work. It's, I think it's a very difficult thing to, to put something like this together. There's a YouTube channel, BCI Guys, that put together a, a good neuro tech primer, kind of a beginner's uh, look into all the, all these kind of factors. So that's something that is worth looking into as well. But uh, yeah, very cool. And then I guess for me, for uh, talking about me on your podcast, I'm Laden and I, I host the Neural Implant Podcast. And I talk to the leaders in the brain computer interface space, generally neurotechnology as well. And uh, I've had something like 180 guests on so far. So really a lot of people, and it's just a fun way to figure out what's, who's doing what, and uh, you don't have to read uh, the scientific papers, which a lot of times you can be outside of the academic paywall. And then you're stuck paying $30 per paper, which is not good. So this is a way to, to be able to get that for free and straight from the horse's mouth, essentially. So that's my show. Yeah. And it's a good podcast to actually get into the details of, of everything that's actually going and you do a good job there, Laden. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you. Arun, I think this has been great. Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to mention? Nope, nothing from my side. Thanks for kindling the opinionated side of me in that few minutes that we had here, Laden. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think this is good. And, and I, I love this kind of opinionated stuff. And I love controversy, you know, that, so we'll see what kind of engagement or, or what people think about this. I'm very curious. As long as the controversy triggers a discussion, everybody is okay to disagree, but doesn't necessarily is ready to fight the other person. I think it should only stay as a discussion with a lot of respect. And I think... But, this is not a controversial topic. It's about how different people see it differently and also how people should be aware of an information when something is put out publicly is the way I kind of um, see it. Yeah, definitely. I, I guess I didn't make that clear. Yeah, not controversy for controversy's sake, but something that'll improve the field and, and, and make everybody better. And, and yeah, exactly. Start a discussion and iterate positively. So Arun, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks, lad. I appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the show and were able to learn something new, bringing together different fields in novel ways. Until next time on the Neural Implant Podcast.